corkscrew solutions problem solving with a twist um so i hope you can join us for that one um it's going to be 6 30 um so slightly later than sorry 7 30 so slightly later than usually um but i hope you can still make it and then <clears throat> we obviously have an easter break um and in april we will have um dean um dean lachana he's been with us i don't know how many times <laughs> yeah, how once, many once per have? year for sure once yeah per year. um but we'll have a poria workshop that hopefully you can join us too and also i'm going to uh, i'll ping a link to the next event in a chat in a minute and also um a link to the youtube channel in case you cannot make any of the events or you didn't take notes and you want to have a look at the presentation from the event that you did attend, um, you can do it there. Yeah, just a couple of notes more. Next week event will be at this particular time because of uh, the time zone of the speaker that as mentioned is calling from New Zealand. Okay, so it was too early for, uh, for him uh, at our usual time. And uh, again, another invitation, you see that uh, we are collecting and we are arranging events with great speakers, but however, I want to remind you that uh, we are a community. And so if you have something to share, if you have uh, some experience that uh, you will uh, uh, want to put on the discussion, maybe to identify some improvement on some different behaviors, this community is absolutely open to host uh, your, uh, um, your speech. So keep in contact with me or Ursula to, if you want to arrange this event. And let me tell you that uh, a leading community is a community where everyone can participate on the community. So now that with the virtual, we can connect people from all over the world, this invitation is absolutely uh, more valuable than, uh, than before. Um, we are recording the event, uh, so you will see uh, in, in YouTube when I will be able to upload it. Um, I think that's all. Uh, one more, uh, a couple information more. Um, Bjorte is going to share the deck later, so I will let you know how you can download the presentation. And uh, so also you can put your questions on... Uh, on the chat and ideally at the end we have a Q&A session where we are going into these questions one by one. So feel free to add your question here. Today's topic is absolutely critical. Uh, let me share my personal experience. Uh, in my company, we really, really want to move to a different mindset, a different way of working. But when we are in the position to found the initiatives, here we are struggling. And this is pretty common across many companies that are doing the agile transformation. That means also change the way of funding. And today Bjorn is here just to present this, uh, this opportunity. So uh, absolutely great, uh, uh, great uh, possibility for uh, all of us to see. Thank you Bjorn again for sharing your experience. You have the word, please. Thank you very much and uh, hello to everybody. Thank you for joining this uh, session. Um, if you wonder about the rustic background of my room here, I'm actually in my mountain cabin and uh, I'm gonna go skiing tomorrow. But first, I'm gonna do this session. I am uh, uh, based in a Norwegian energy company called uh, Equinor. We used to be called Statoil. Uh, we are Scandinavia's uh, largest uh, company. And uh, I work in the corporate finance organization of this, uh, uh, of this uh, company. Uh, but uh, these days, I spend roughly half my time outside of the company doing things like this, um, uh, doing um, workshops with companies, uh, some consulting. Uh, there was a massive interest for beyond budgeting today all over the world. And of course it has definitely something to do with, with uh, COVID uh, and I will, come, I will come back to that. 
It was in no way given that I should sit here today and talk about beyond budgeting because my career started in a very different place. I graduated from business school back in 1983 and I joined Staton, as we were called back then. Um, and that job was in the corporate budget department where I became the manager the year after. So I've been heading up more budget processes in my life and I want to be reminded about in that job and in many other finance manager jobs in different places in Europe. I spent uh, quite a number of years working uh, abroad. So that was 1983. In um, uh, 10 years later, uh, 1994, um, Statoil, together with another company, set up a petrochemicals company called Borealis, Europe's largest at the time, with 30 plants across Europe, headquartered in Copenhagen. And um, I was asked to, to head up the finance function in this company. And through some coincidences, we were able to, or got the chance, the opportunity to kick out the budget in 1995. Um, and guess what? It worked perfectly. Cost came down, uh, we did not lose control. We were a bit scared because it was a big jump in, into the dark. There was nothing called beyond budgeting at the time. And um, um, yeah, we, we felt pretty alone. Um, even if there were, were other companies we discovered later that had done the same. In 1998, I moved from finance to human resources and um, uh, headed up HR for uh, uh, four years before I returned to Statoil and started to work as corporate controller for our international business. Uh, but my hobby at the time was to pester my colleagues with the stupidity of the budgeting that the company was, was, uh, was, was doing. And um, I don't think I was very diplomatic looking back. Uh, but after three years, we actually uh, together went to the executive committee and proposed not just to kick out the budget because now this had become broader, now it was about changing the way we were leading and managing in this company. And we got a yes. And since then, I have been working full time on this, uh, on, on Beyond Budgeting. I am also the chairman of the Beyond Budgeting Roundtable, an international network of companies interested in, um, uh, in Beyond Budgeting. So that's the, uh, the reason why I'm sitting here talking about Beyond Budgeting. That's how it all started. So I would like to share with you my slides and the topic for today is an introduction to beyond budgeting business agility in practice. What I want to share with you is first the case for change. What's, what is the problem? And uh, of course, I mean, you, you are here because you know there are problems, not just with budgeting, but with traditional management, but um, maybe this problem is even deeper and even more systemic than what we sometimes think. So that's the bad news. The good news is that there are solutions beyond budgeting is such a solution. It is actually a somewhat misleading name because the purpose of beyond budgeting is not necessarily to get rid of budgets. The purpose is to create organizations that are more dynamic, more flexible, uh, and more human, more agile if you want. And in order to do that or achieve that, we need to change traditional management. And what do we find at the core of traditional management? We find not just the budgeting process, but also the budgeting mindset. So this is where the name is coming from. Um, but every time you hear beyond budgeting, think about this as business agility um, or also as a, a viable management model, because that's also what this is, is about. And it is a word that we actually are playing a bit with these days. So I'm going to talk about the model itself. And then I'd like to share with you a few exciting cases before we move to the main case today, which is our model, how we do this in, in um, Equinor, and we call our model ambition to action. So that's basically the story for uh, today, three sections. Every time I talk about beyond budgeting, there is a word coming up from the audience. 
um, and that word is control. And the context is, of course, the fear of losing control. When I ask people if they can please define control for me, what do you mean with control? After people have said cost control, many actually go quiet. They struggle with defining what they mean with this thing they are so afraid of losing. So let's take a look at what Oxford Dictionary is saying when it comes to the definition of control. And they call it the power to influence or direct people's behavior or the course of events. And what this, does this mean in organizational terms, in business terms? Well, it basically means controlling people and controlling the future. And here we find the two assumptions that underpins so much in traditional management. Number one, people can't be trusted. Number two, the future is predictable and planable. And we are challenging both those assumptions heavily in Beyond Budgeting, because we think these are more illusions of control. For instance, that people can and must be managed. Well, of course you can manage people, but if people are managed in stupid ways, they hopefully find a way around in order to get their job done. And when it comes to the future, the only thing we know is that we don't know. There are wise people out there agreeing with what I'm saying here. Um, but and one of them is, um, is, is Peter Drucker, as you probably know. Um, most of what we call management is about making it difficult for people to do their job. When it comes to trust that I just um, uh, mentioned, I used to travel a lot before the pandemic. And the first thing I always um, checked when I entered the hotel room was what kind of clothing hangers did they have? Because there are basically two types that we meet. And I think we can all agree that um, the one at the bottom is uh, hopeless to use compared to the one at the top. I can't st stand the, the one at the bottom. It is so cumbersome. So why do some hotels have hangers that are not very user friendly? Well, the reason is probably that there was a, a few episodes where some guests stole that uh, traditional hanger with a hook. And what was the response? To punish everybody because somebody did something wrong. You're putting everybody in jail because somebody did something wrong. Actually, one of the problems with traditional management. When it comes to planning and the future, there was another wise person, Russell Eckhoff. He compared a lot of the corporate planning he observed in organizations. He compared it with a ritual rain dance. It has no effect on the weather, but those who engage in it think it does. And I understand what Mr. Eckhoff is talking about here. I have done a lot of dancing in my life. I'm not really sure that it helped the performance of the organization. All right, so much for wise people. Imagine an organization that a hundred years ago invented a fantastic machine, state of the art, and key for the success of this organization. 50 years ago, this machine started to make some trouble. And today, this machine is completely broken. Couple, it looked like this. You will all understand that this can't be a true story. And it isn't, because in real life, people would have gotten together 50 years ago and done something either try to fix it, or even better, try to invent a new machine better, because innovation is something we all love, right? Innovation is great. You all want to be leading edge, unique, right around the forefront, but better than everybody else, wonderful. But that enthusiasm for innovation seems to be limited to technology innovation around products and services. But there is also so something called management innovation that we shall talk about today. Management innovation, exploring new ways of leading and managing. And management innovation, that is not great. That is scary. Kicking out the budget, are you crazy? 
The consequence of this is that it's very crowded on the left-hand side. Everybody is into this kind of innovation in some form or shape. On the management innovation arena, however, that is not yet a crowded place because it is scary. And that is actually good news for brave companies who dare to explore, to embrace also this kind of innovation, because you can get just as much performance, competitive advantage out of management innovation as you can get from technology innovation. There are companies out there who openly admit that we have no advantage whatsoever in what we produce, what we sell, we find it in the way we lead and manage. And I've got a few examples for you a little bit later. So this performance word is important. Performance def defined in the right way. That is the reason why should, we should do beyond budgeting because it is good for performance. So I will talk a lot more about that important word. But before that, it is after all called beyond budgeting. Of course, it has something to do with budgets as well and budget problems. So I would like to share with you first my budget problem uh, list so that we can check that we are um, in the same place here um, before we will move on and talk about um, performance again. My budget problem list is quite long. It starts with something that almost everybody mentions, that it is a very time consuming process. Of course it is. It takes time to make budgets and follow up budgets. Um, the problem does belong on the list, but I would not call it the biggest problem. There are bigger problems further on, further on here. Assumptions quickly outdated. Um, uh, 2020 was a very good example of that with COVID-19. The 2020 was full of dead uh, and outdated budgets, and the same has already happened for 2021. Budgeting can stimulate what I call unethical behaviors, the lowballing, the gaming, the sandbagging, the resource hoarding, the internal negotiations. That is not the kind of behavior we would like to see in our organizations. So this is a huge um, uh, problem. I'm not necessarily blaming people behaving like this because they are responding to the system that we ask them to operate within, but still the result is unethical behaviors, or at least borderline unethical behaviors. Budgets can create illusions of control. Of course, it feels very comfortable to have next year um, uh, spelled out with accounting precision and, and a million details and decimals. But again, the only thing we know is that it will be wrong. We simply don't know. And if we don't have control, whatever it means, it's better to acknowledge that we don't have control and act accordingly than to think that we have control and act accordingly. Budgets force us to make decisions way too early. We have to make these decisions in the autumn, the year before, uh, about what we shall do next year and what it shall uh, uh, cost. And in big companies, these, these decisions are very often taken too high up. That doesn't always improve the quality of decisions. Sometimes it's, it's actually the very opposite. Budgets can prevent us from doing things that we should have done. Good stuff. But we can't because it's not in the budget. But this also works the other way around. It can lead us to do things that we maybe shouldn't have done. But it is in the budget and it is spent it or lose it. And linked to this, I mean, I can, I, I, I acknowledge that a budget can be, a cost budget can be a, a very effective ceiling on, on, on cost, but let's not forget that it is just as effective as a floor for the reasons that we just have discussed. To define good performance as hitting your budget numbers is a very narrow, mechanical, and sometimes a completely outdated way of, of describing good performance. We need a richer, broader, more intelligent performance language. And last but not least, a problem that actually not too many have thought about, and I will come back to it a bit later, but I call it conflicting purposes. And what makes this problem special is that it is both a problem, but also represents a solution, a way to get started that actually also can solve many of the other problems here. 
So I will come back to this, this problem a bit later. I have shared this list of budget problems with hundreds of thousands of people around the world in the 25 years I've been working with beyond budgeting. And the interesting thing is that most people agreed out there actually agree. Executives, um, managers, actually even, even most finance people. At the same time, most organizations out there still continue doing this stuff, which is quite interesting. Uh, and I've, I've, of course, thought long and hard about why. And, and of course, one reason could be that, well, we've always done, done it like this and almost everybody else is doing it like this. But another reason might be that, yes, we recognize these problems, that these problems are more like irritating itches. They are not symptoms of, of any deeper or bigger or more systemic problem. But that is exactly what these problems are symptoms of a very serious problem, which also represents a paradox. Because here we have a, 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 a way of managing, a way of thinking invented roughly a hundred years ago. It's pretty old management technology we talk about. And in case you don't know, budgets were invented by Mr. James O. McKinsey, the founder of McKinsey Consulting. I never met Mr. McKinsey, but I don't think he was an evil man. I actually think he had the best of intentions. He wanted to help organizations perform better. And I'm sure it worked 100 years ago, maybe even 50 years ago, but no longer today, because today things have changed, as we'll come back to. Today, this way of managing, this way of thinking, is doing exactly the opposite of what Mr. McKinsey wanted. Um, budgeting has become more of a barrier than a support for getting out the best possible performance in organizations, and I would call that a pretty big problem. But we are back to this important word, performance, and I would like to reflect on that word now for a few minutes in a slightly different setting, or quite a different setting actually, than business and, organization and organizations. I would like us to move into traffic because in traffic when we are out driving we would also like to experience good performance and for me that is a safe and good flow i simply hate traffic jams and by the way i never understood why they call it the rush hour looks like cars are standing dead still um there's no rush at all but there is so much i don't understand anyway i think traffic authorities want the same and this is all something we often meet, put up by traffic authorities to create a safe and good flow. This traffic light has no sensors, okay? The one who is in control here, who makes decisions about when you can drive, when you have to stop, that is the person who programmed this light. And where would this person be as you are sitting waiting for that green light? Well, maybe in the office prog programming another light, or maybe in bed, if you are out driving at night, the person would typically not be in the situation. I don't think there's anybody sitting inside that pool. I never checked, but I don't think so. And which information would this programming be based on? It would be based on some historical trends, maybe some forecasts, but it would not be entirely fresh information as we sit and wait for that green light. Fortunately, there is an alternative, a very different solution with exactly the same purpose, a safe and good flow. We are talking about the roundabout. Here, the same questions get very different answers because here we as drivers are in control. We make decisions about when to drive and when to stop. And the information that we base these decisions on are fresh, real time, here and now information. So very different answers. It could be interesting to compare a bit more these two ways of vanishing. So let's do that. And here I've got a few leading questions for you. Which of these two is normally most efficient? Well, it's actually proven scientifically that the roundabout is not just more efficient, it is also safer. Which is most difficult, which takes most competence? Of course, it's the roundabout. 
And going back to our organizations, everything we need to leave behind of traditional management is much easier in many senses and, and for most people involved compared to what we need to move towards. But we can't go for what's easy because it's easy. We have to go for the stuff that is best for performance, even if it takes more competence and is more difficult. Is it relevant to talk about values in this setting here? At Equinor, we are trying hard to be a values-based company. And the opposite, we can maybe a bit simplified, call a rules-based company. The traffic light is a good example of, of uh, rules-based management. Red is stop and green is drive. We can always discuss the one in the middle, but um, it is rules-based management. And if there is a mindset, a value set among people waiting for that green light, which is about me first, I don't care about the rest. That mindset, that value set is normally not a big problem in front of that light, overruled, hopefully by, by red. But in the roundabout, me first, I don't care about the rest, can actually be a big problem. Because here we are much more dependent on everybody involved sharing a, and having a, po a, a common positive wish or purpose of wanting this to play, flow well. We have to help each other. We have to interact with people in a very different way than what we do in front of that light. So enough fresh information, act on it, you need a positive value set. Another difference here, in front of that light, you can sit, let, let the sit and doze off and let the mind wander, listen to the radio. In the roundabout, you need to be on, present in the situation. Words are important in the stuff we are talking about now. And there are some words in the corporate language that I really don't like, some labels. And one of those labels is performance management. I dislike it for two reasons. First of all, I find it quite negative because what we basically are saying is that if we don't manage performance, there will be no performance. Second, I think there's quite some illusion of control into this. I think our ability to manage performance in today's people and realities is somewhat limited compared to what they often like to think. But performance management is a label that fits nicely when we talk about the traffic light, because that's exactly what the traffic companies are doing. They are managing performance very directly. In the roundabout, on the other hand, it is actually about something else. Here, it is more about creating conditions for great performance to take place. It is about enabling performance, not managing performance. And this is more than playing with words. Right? These are two fundamentally different ways of approaching that very important question. How do we get the best possible performance in our organization. And I will come back when we move to Equinor about examples of how you can enable instead of manage uh, uh, performance. Uh, let's leave traffic. Uh, the roundabout is a more self-regulating way of managing. And in today's uh, people and business realities, um, uh, organizations need more um, self-regulating uh, management models for those two reasons. First of all, um, our business environment, uh, which has a lot more of the VUCA, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, the ambiguity, than when I started my budget and planning career in the early 80s. And if we take that VUCA level seriously, it must have implications for how we design our management models compared to if there is no or little VUCA out there. That should be quite obvious. The other reality we need to reflect on is not external, it's internal. It has to do with people, and it has to do with asking ourselves a simple but important question. What kind of people do we generally believe that we have in our organization? And there are many labels and languages uh, for, for that important question. Uh, we, have, um, we went back to good old Douglas McGregor um, and his... Uh, theory X and theory Y, these two opposing views on people and what motivates people. And I should probably why 
no, the theory x is the negative most people in an organization is a bunch of potential thieves and crooks and um, unless we manage tightly and keep them on short leeches they will all run away do a lot of stupid things and spend money like drunken sailors those were not McGregor's words he was a bit more polite and academic but I actually think that is what he meant then you have his theory why a very much more positive view on people a view that believing that most people actually want to do a good job want to be involved want to be listened to want to be treated as adults and we don't need to agree so far on where our sympathy lies x or y even if i have a certain hope but it should be very easy to agree that if we mainly believe in x our management process and model should look very different compared to if we mainly believe in y if we combine these two realities we need to reflect on the world out there people and the organization it could look like this you recognize the two dimensions and i would argue that traditional management lies in that lower left hand corner with a conscious or unconscious view that the world is still a stable and planable place and that most people is on the x side if we disagree with that, then this is not the place to be. Then we need to move up in that upper right hand corner by addressing both leadership horizontally and our management processes vertically. And what we need to get out of um, traditional management is something that's very rigid, it's very detailed, it's very annual, it's very rules based. There's a lot of micromanagement, centralized command and control. A lot of secrecy and a strong belief in sticks and carrots as ways to drive performance. I recall when I made this slide, wrote these words, then I said to myself, Bjorte, don't be too hard on traditional management here. But again, I've been sharing these words with so many people all over the world. And I have to admit that uh, it is scary sometimes how many looks I get which the only way i can interpret them is so what isn't this the way it has to be well maybe again there was a time when this was the right thing to do uh, maybe there still are places around uh, where this is the right thing to do but for us in equinor that discussion is not very interesting we know that our business environment is way up there uh, when it comes to VUCA level and we believe that the big majority of people in, in Equinor is on the Y side. Uh, if not, we have done an awful job on recruitment, but we haven't. Still, I have to admit that every time I talk about X and Y, there are a few names, a few faces popping up in my head. <laughs> they are actually in there right now. And those belong to colleagues of mine at Equinor that I maybe would put a bit more on the left-hand side than on the right-hand side. I'm not saying they are crooks, but you understand what I mean. And maybe there are a few names and faces popping up in your head as well now, because maybe we find some people like this in all organizations or companies, but that is not the issue. The issue is where is the majority? And if the big majority is on the Y side, then it is theory Y that must drive the design of our management models. And then we need to find other ways of dealing with the guys on the left hand side again as we talked about on uh, earlier we should not uh, we don't put everybody in jail because we have some criminals among us right we are all free citizens within certain boundaries by the way it is interesting with x and y is that i have yet to come across somebody that themselves say that i'm an x person if you ask people everybody says they are, they are y that's also a bit a bit interesting Anyway, what do we need to do here? On the leadership side, we need to, to be not just more values-based, but also more purpose-based. We need more autonomy, more empowerment. We need more transparency. And this is good news for all the scared people that I have met over the years. Um, again, who are so afraid of losing control. And the good news is that transparency can be quite an effective control mechanism, a social control mechanism, right? And let, you, let me give you a, a little example. Uh, there is a huge Swiss pharmaceutical company called Roche, 
who today is, by the way, on a beyond budgeting journey. But a few years back, they did a very interesting experiment. In a pilot, they kicked out the travel budget, all travel rules and regulations, and replaced it with full transparency. So with a few exceptions, everybody could um, see everything. If you traveled to where, did you sleep, eat, fly, cheap or expensive? open for your colleagues to see and vice versa. And guess what happened with travel cost in that pilot? Came down through a very simple self-regulating control mechanism. This was about tearing out pages in that rules book instead of doing the opposite. But I have to add here on transparency that it is a very powerful me mechanism. It must be applied with wisdom. If it becomes naming and shaming, it doesn't work. And we should always position transparency more from a learning perspective than from a controlled perspective. How can we learn from each other if everything is secret and, and closed? Last but not least, internal or intrinsic motivation as opposed to external or extrinsic motivation. And um, the most common way of motivating people uh, in an extrinsic way in business is, as you know, through individual bonuses. And there is no area, I think, where there is a bigger gap between what research is telling us and what business is practicing. And this is stuff that you probably know. I, was, I, I assume you have seen the Dan Pink uh, uh, movie uh, or video about this um, on, on re what really motivates people. Um, but um, the short re recap is that individual bonus can work if three conditions are in place. If there is little motivation in the job itself, if it's easy to count and measure, and if quantity is more important than quality. So for chasing rats, picking fruit, and maybe, maybe some simple sales work. Maybe. It works. But when we move to knowledge work, then things like mastery, autonomy, uh, purpose, belonging is much more powerful than individual bonus. And what do those things have in common beyond the fact that they all come for free? Well, they are about leadership. And of course, it takes more leadership to, to, to motivate people through mastery, autonomy, purpose, and belonging than to dangle a bag of money in front of people's nose and say, do this and get that. I actually call individual bonus for managerial laziness. Anyway, um, many companies have positive uh, people visions. Um, and intentions, but it doesn't help to have theory Y leadership visions if you have theory X management processes. And that is the case in many companies, creating poisonous gaps between what we preach and what we practice. So we need to, if we have these theory Y leadership uh, processes, then we need to change your management processes to make sure that these processes reflect what we say while at the same time making these management processes more VUCA robust. And here are some examples of things that you typically need to do. And it starts with the traditional detailed annual budget that typically needs to go because it represents so much of what we find in that lower left-hand corner. More specifically, when we shall, um, when we shall um, set targets or goals, we should be inspired by, by, by football or soccer, where it makes sense. Um, and I have yet to hear a football team saying that the ambition for next season is to score 39 goals and get 42 points. Those are budget goals, and they don't think like that. It's all about doing well against peers, doing well against competition, doing well on, on, on the league table. And again, sometimes that way of thinking also makes sense in, in business. And last but not least, we cannot reduce performance evaluation to comparing two numbers and then conclude. We need a richer, broader, more intelligent performance language. And this, my friends, was a crash course in beyond budgeting. It is about addressing both leadership and management processes in order to become more adaptive and more human. It is as simple and as difficult as that. 
some organizations find this horizontal discussion about around people and leadership uh, difficult. If that is the case, you can still get benefits out of this only moving in the uh, vertical dimension, improving your your, your um, um, processes. But if you want and having a more improvement oriented focus, but if you want the full benefit of this, then you also need to address the leadership side and make this more transformational than uh, only uh, improvement oriented. A number of companies are today on this journey in some form or shape. And I could have talked for ages here about amazing management innovation taking place here. And some of these companies you will have heard about, um, others maybe not. I want to share with you just two quick examples before we have to move on. And I'd like to start in Norway. Uh, in the upper left hand corner, there's a company called Miles. Miles is an IT company with business in Norway, in the Baltics, in India and South Africa. Miles have no budgets, no targets, and never had. They started out like this from the beginning. They are growing quite, quite fast. Growth was never a goal. It's a consequence of doing well. If you work for Miles, you can buy whatever PC you want, as expensive as you want, and replace it as, as often as you want. No PC budgets. You can attend whatever conference you want, seminar you want, as often as you want, wherever in the world. No travel budgets, no training budgets. But it's not an anarchy. They have a very simple control mechanism. When you have bought that PC, when you have returned from that training, you need to post on the intranet what you did and the cost of it. So transparency is their control mechanism. And they are very happy with this. No plans about changing anything. They have one small concern, however, that is, could it be too effective? Uh, if that is a problem, I would call it a, a luxury problem. The pioneer here, by the way, is somebody on unmuted here? Uh, if you could please mute, thanks. Um, the pioneer here is a bank. You find that bank at the top of the slide, Handelsbanken. It's a Swedish bank with 700 branches in Northern Europe. They're quite big in the UK. And Handelsbanken has no budgets, no targets, and no individual bonus. Just a lot of uh, fantastic performance. And that fantastic performance they have had for many, many years, because they actually started out already back in 1970. And let's look at the performance over that period, because um, um, it, it, it gives us a chance to test the model. By the way, could some, there's somebody not muted here. Could you please, please uh, mute yourself? Please mute yourself. Thank you. Uh, it's an amazing performance. Uh, this bank has been form, performed better than the average of its competitors every single year since 1972. That is how they define performance, by the way. Again, they think football, doing well, well on the league table. This bank is among the most cost-effective universal banks in, 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 uh, in Europe. And the bank has never needed a bailout or any help from the authorities because they messed it up. It can't be a coincidence. Uh, management model quite different from, from most other banks. A lot of autonomy, a lot of transparency, uh, very dynamic, um, and this fantastic performance over such a long time. Handelsbanken and some other companies here inspired what became known as Beyond Budgeting in back in 1998 and inspired the, the, the formulation of the 12 Beyond Budgeting principles, which, as you um, will see on the next slide, has many similarities with the Agile Manifesto. Uh, but these principles were actually formulated um, uh, some years earlier, back in 1998. The principles look like this. And I will not go, go through this in detail uh, here, uh, but a few reflections um, around um, some of them and uh, the totality of it. As you can see, we are addressing both leadership and management processes. On the leadership side, I ha have already talked a bit about purpose, values, 
transparency, autonomy. Uh, when it comes to organization, principle four, we are organizationally agnostic in the sense that this can work in many different types of, of organizational structures. A very important part here is to create a coherence between what we preach on the left hand side, what we practice on the right hand side. And a classical example of the opposite that we find in so many organizations, um, it doesn't help to talk loud and warm on the left hand side about how fantastic people we have on board and we would be nothing without you and we trust you so much. But not that much. Moving to management processes, principle 10, kicking out the travel budget, are you crazy? Hypocrisy is what I call it. Again, poisonous gaps between what we say and what we do. There has to be consistency. I will come back to um, some of these management process um, uh, principles uh, in, in, in the coming slides. I'm, I'm not going through them in, in any detail uh, now. Uh, these principles are exactly that, principles. This is not a recipe. What this should mean in an organization depends on, 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 on that organization's uh, history, culture, type of business. So what has taken place in the organizations we just looked at? It's not identical as such. And that's the way it should be. I don't like management recipes because in a management recipe, and there are quite a lot of number, many of them out there, somebody has done all the thinking for you. The only thing you shall do is to um, f uh, buy the books, uh, read them by the way, hire the consultants, fi um, follow the instructions, tick the boxes. I find that quite boring and also quite dangerous. Here you have to think for yourself. Two classical misunderstandings before we move on here. Uh, or misunderstanding about beyond budgeting. Some people think it's just another way of managing cost. And yes, it is as expressed uh, in, under principle 10, but there are 11 other principles. This is a, quite a, a comprehensive leadership and management model. Second misunderstanding, beyond budgeting, no budget, cost is not important, I can spend whatever I want. Sorry, that is not what we are saying. Cost is still important together with other things in order to create value. And because cost is important, we need more intelligent, more effective ways of managing cost um, than what Mr. M McKinsey could offer us a hundred years ago. All right, some people, especially finance people, find the totality of this a bit scary, a bit big. If that is the case, there is a safe way to get started, and uh, my apologies for the pun, um, but there is, a, there is a, a way of getting started that is um, uh, logical and not scary. And it has to do with asking ourselves, why do we budget? And when you think about that question, I want to remind you that we, when we are talking budgets, it is not only cost budgets. We are also talking investment budgets, we are talking revenue, sales budgets, we are talking cash flow budgets and, and kind of the, the whole totality of, of budgets. But that question, why do we budget, has, actually, has more than one answer. Companies make budgets in order to set targets, financial targets, sales targets, production targets. At the same time, the, this budget shall be a kind of forecast of what next year can look like in terms of cash flow, financial capacity. And last but not least, the budget is a resource allocation process, handing out bags of money to people on costs and on investments. And it might seem very efficient to solve all these three purposes in one process and one set of numbers, but that is also the problem. And let me give you one example. Let's assume that we are on our way into a budget process and at corporate level, uh, we want to understand next year's um, cash flows. So we start on the revenue side and ask people responsible for sales numbers, what's your best number for next year? But everybody knows that the numbers I'm, I'm, I'm providing will come back to me as a target for next year, maybe with a bonus attached. And that, that insight might do something to the level of numbers submitted. 
And moving to the, the, the cost side investments, when, 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 when people are asked here, what's your best number for next year? Then everybody uh, knows that this is my only shot at getting access to resources for next year. And um, some remember maybe also that 20% cut of last year. And that insight and that memory might also do something to the uh, level of numbers submitted. And I think you understand and uh, recognize what I'm talking about. This is a problem, not just because it destroys the quality of numbers, but, but even, I mean, it, 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 it stimulates this behavior I talk, talked about that is at least borderline unethical. Even if we shouldn't blame people, we should blame the system. Fortunately, there is a very simple solution here. We should and can still do all these three things, but in three separate processes, because these are different things. A target is an aspiration. It's what we want to happen. While a forecast is an expectation. It's what we think will happen, whether we like what we see or not. And resource allocation is about optimizing scarce resources in order to get to um, where we want to get. And because we have separated, um, we can make these purposes more distinct. And this can be different numbers. For instance, target more um, ambitious than, than a forecast. But even more important, because we are separated, we can start to improve each one in ways impossible when it was all bundled in one process and one set of numbers on the left hand side. Now we can have great discussions about how can we set targets that really inspire and stretch with our people feeling stretched, which are more VUCA robust. Some companies continue this discussion into do we need all these targets? Um, so great discussions around targets. How can we take the politics out of forecasting uh, so that we get so that we can trust the numbers? We don't need, need a million details here. This is not accounting looking backwards. This is looking at the future, there's uncertainty, and we need to leave the accounting mindset behind. And last but not least, how can we find other and better ways of, of optimizing um, financial resources? And um, here are some headlines, um, and I'll come back to this a little bit uh, in a minute. But before, uh, but also uh, what is important is that um, because we've separated, we can organize each of these on rhythms that better uh, reflect the purpose of each one and the type of business we are in. So more event driven and less calendar driven. Uh, I don't have time to go much in detail here, but I just want to give you one example when it comes to managing uh, investments in Equinor projects. Uh, and projects for us is very much um, steel and and, um, and and concrete building um, building uh, pipelines or windmills or, or or offshore platforms. We don't have a, a traditional annual detailed investment budget, but we sit in the autumn year, the year before and decides everything, um, exactly how much we shall invest, and um, exactly on on which projects. And, and then each project gets the bags, a bag of money for, for next year's spending. Instead, we have a concept where we say that the bank is always open. Business can always forward, forward a, a, a project for approval. How high up you need is regulated by a mandate structure to make sure that not everything ends up on the, uh, at the executive committee level. Whether you get a yes or no depends on two things. How good is your project? And can we afford it as things look today? And that information about how things look today is coming from something we call dynamic forecasting. We have a dynamic forecasting process where, where our forecasts are simply updated when stuff happens out there, when people think a forecast should be updated. So this is beyond budgeting versions of continuous delivery. Not continuous delivery of software functionality, but continuous delivery of uh, decisions and financial resources. All right, uh, let us move to Equinor and our process, which we call ambition to action. Three purposes, it's about translating strategy, we've just also integrated risk management. 
It is about securing this agility I've been talking about, room to act and perform. And last but not least, it is about activating values and leadership principles in Equinor. There are some steps in this uh, process where some people tell us that, well, we have something similar. That could be, but the way we do this, I still believe is quite different from, from most companies. It starts out with translating strategy into what we call strategic objectives. So what does success look like on a medium term time horizon? We are more on words than on numbers here. Then it's time for risks. So what kind of risks can jeopardize or hinder us in um, moving towards these objectives? What other types of risks do we have in our activities that we need to address? Then it is time for actions. What kind of actions do we need to move towards those objectives to mitigate risk? And very often that can be one and the same thing. So one process, one system. And then we are also trying to understand consequences of actions through forecasts. Then it's time for measurement. Measuring that we are moving towards those strategic um, objectives. The only problem with measurement is that measurement alone moves nothing. Nothing happens just because we measure. You don't lose weight simply by weighing yourself. And I know because I've tried and that was not a big success. And then, my, by the way, my wife told me that, Bjarte, maybe you didn't stand there long enough. Well, that would have been so one kind of action, but the point is that nothing happens before we do something. That is why it's called ambition to action. I also want you to note that we use the, the, um, the, um, the label indicators instead of KPIs. The reason for that is that the I in KPI stands for indicator, and we tend to forget that that these are indicators. They are indicators that we are moving towards these objectives, but they are not necessarily telling the full truth. They are not called KPTs. They are called KPIs, and we must never um, forget. Last but not least, what does all of this mean for you and me and the teams that we are in? And here is a very important um, concept. Uh, one of the most important principles um, in Equinor is that, or maybe the most important, is that how we deliver is as important as what we deliver. And with how we deliver, we are talking about the values in the company. And the weighting between the two in all consequences for your career and for your pay is 50-50. What you see here is an integrated performance process running quite seamlessly from strategy via risk, via finance, into human resources. We have worked quite closely together to make this hang together because it must hang, hang together. If not, people out there notice. Here is an example of an ambition to action. It's a bit crowded uh, this slide, but it's a screenshot from the system where we keep these ambition to actions. And this is one of 900, 900 as I will come back to. Um, and uh, uh, you recognize the first four steps from the pre previous slides, and then the HR process is following on further to the right here. And the five perspectives we have here uh, behind each red arrow is, um, uh, is inspired by, by the balanced scorecard thinking, which um, um, I actually have an, if you're familiar with balanced scorecards, I have an, ambivalent view on balanced scorecards because um, used in the wrong way, they can be used to reinforce traditional management in <clears throat> very effective ways. We are trying to do this uh, in the opposite way, as I will come back to. But it simply means that uh, the thinking here is that uh, in the finance perspective, we, we are trying to um, express that we want to create value. That will never happen unless we do well towards customers and markets. And that will never happen <coughs> unless we do well on internal operations, which will again never happen unless we do well on people and organization. And in our case, safety, security, sustainability. So this is about winding back to the drivers and the things you need to uh, do well on in order to create uh, value. Um, System-wise here, if you click on anything here, you get down into more details on, 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 on everything. This is, um, we, are, this, uh, we have a global SAP solution and this is actually programmed 
into SAP and uh, believe it or not, it works. Again, today we have around 900 of these in the organization and uh, I want to use this slide to uh, illustrate two other important um, features in, of the model. The first has to do with alignment. How do we create the red thread throughout here? We have a strategy we want to implement. It can't be an anarchy. The easy way to create alignment is top-down cascading, meaning that we sit at corporate level and simply instruct all the way down. This is the content of your ambition to actions especially when it comes to the numbers. And many finance people tend to like that kind of top-down cascading because afterwards they can add up all the local numbers and it matches the corporate number down to the last decimal and then they can sleep well at night. We are going to deliver because it all hangs together. Well, I wish it were that, was that simple, but it isn't. In our culture, in our company, that kind of top-down cascading, if your own ambition to action only becomes a landing ground for instruction from above, the ownership, the commitment, the motivation walks out the door, and then it doesn't help that the numbers add up. So that doesn't work, but still we need alignment, and we create that through what we call translation, which simply means that when a, a team out there, a unit shall either make a new ambition to action or update their current one, they would take a look around, maybe one level up, further up, maybe all the way to corporate, a bit left and right, if, they, if, if that is relevant. And then the team should have a deep and good discussion. What does our ambition to action need to look like to support those um, that we have a relationship to? If such a translation should go wrong, of course the level above should do what they are paid for, but it's not the problem. And a key reason for that is transparency. Because all of these ambition tractions are open accessible for all employees. There's, there should be no place to hide with a stupid ambition traction. There is some share sensitive, some confidential information we have to close or hide, but that is something that people understand and, 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 um, and, and, and um, yeah, uh, accept. We've also said that it's not mandatory to have an ambition to action, because if we say it's mandatory, then um, uh, again, it's easily seen as um, uh, this is the corporate control uh, process. Um, we don't want that to be the perception. We want these teams to perceive that ambition to action is something we have um, in order to help ourselves to run our own business. And if that works well, the results at corporate well is equally, um, equally good. When it comes to rhythm, then these teams, we are trying to get out of the calendar rhythm as much as possible. These teams and units can in principle change whatever they want on their own ambition to action at any time, when there is a need for it. When something happens in their own business environment that they think justify if, um, a change. And that includes um, uh, even changing targets if targets have lost their meaning, impossible to achieve or a piece of cake. But again, it's not an anarchy. We have a simple control mechanism in addition to transparency. Because we say that if you want to change something that's big, you still need to have a talk with, or you need to have a talk with a level above. If it's a small change, you just inform at a suitable time. When this was introduced, um, people said, fine, I like that big and small, but what is big and what is small? And some had expectations that we should define that at corporate level on behalf of everybody, which is impossible. So we have delegated it, which means that there might be somebody in one part of the organization with a different definition of big and small than somebody in another part of the organization. Um, but that is okay as long as it works both places, right? So back to this self-regulation, we would like this to run as much as possible continuously by itself. We shall not abdicate at corporate. We shall intervene if needed, support if needed, but the more this can run by itself, the better. Let me finish off with Another very important part of the model, we are talking about performance evaluation and what we call a holistic performance evaluation. And holistic here means two things. First of all, uh, the 50-50 I just talked about between the what and the how. But it also means that when we shall evaluate what is delivered in, in, in business terms, 
then that should be an evaluation against the whole ambition to action. It should not just be an exercise of adding up the number of red and green indicators and then conclude because these indicators again, they are in only indicating something. So we need to go behind measured results and pressure test um, by asking, I see that your indicator is green, but have we really moved towards uh, that strategic objective? When we look at what measurement maybe didn't pick up, how ambitious were your targets? Should we punish somebody that stressed themselves, set themselves an ambitious target and didn't completely make it? And do the opposite with somebody who lowballed and gamed and made it? Has there been significant changes in assumptions? Headwind, tailwind of such a nature that it should be taken into account? Not everything, but big stuff should be. How was risks handled? And what's the sustainability of what you have delivered? Or did you do some strange things in December in order to, 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 to make things look nice? The, after we have uh, addressed these questions, we can have a view on what kind of performance from a delivery point of view are we looking at. Some of these questions can also be relevant in the behavior evaluation uh, against behavior goals. The purpose of this evaluation hasn't changed much. It's mainly about learning and development. There is also um, a certain link to rewards, even if we have been trying to make that weaker and weaker over the years. So, so narrowing this, this um, concept of, or, or, or kind of reducing this concept of, of pay for performance. So uh, one example, some years ago, we had a rating in both dimensions of one to five. Um, we kicked it out because nobody liked it, including myself. So this is what I wanted to share with you. These are my coordinates if you want to contact me Later on, if you want to follow me on Twitter or LinkedIn, I only write about stuff like this. There are no cats and dogs and grandchildren. And if you want to um, check out the Beyond Budgeting Roundtable, um, this is the address. We are having some technical issues for the moment, but uh, just give it um, give it a little break and try again. We are hoping we can, we can fix it. And last but not least, what you know I've heard is the actually the very short version of all of this. This is the long version, uh, where there's more of everything uh, around the problems, more about beyond budgeting, and, and um, um, another case that uh, I, I didn't address, more about what we did in Borealis. Uh, there's a chapter about beyond budgeting in Agile because of, of all the similarities, and obviously much more about implementation that I didn't have time to talk about today. I've been trying to write the book I wanted to read myself, so people say it's an easy read. All right. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to your questions. Yeah, thank you, Jort. Thank you. Uh, we didn't disturb your speech, but actually the chat was pretty active. We had a lot of uh, references across the agile principles while you were talking. Um, I, I also want to mention a comment that was really fun from uh, Moon Wai Chung that says that US cost actually the roundabout as the traffic light also. <laughs> no. Moon Wai, can you confirm that? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, first of all, on the West Coast, we don't have I'm in California, so we don't have roundabouts. Everything is traffic light. And uh, the, the stretch of road that I usually travel about, oh, I don't know, about one minute or two minutes now actually have three sets of traffic lights in it. Um, so yeah, US just love to add traffic lights. And then there's one intersection. I finally saw a roundabout, but I'm very confused because they have traffic lights on each of the entrance of the roundabout. So I went for green light to get into the roundabout. And then I saw another set of traffic light, but I was like, oh, wait, that's not for my direction, is it? But I'm turning roundabout. So am I supposed to stop? So there are a lot of cars that stop in the middle of the roundabout because they saw red light from the opposite direction, which I suppose is a great example here. <laughs> yes. Ouch, ouch. Yes. So um, we, we trust you, but not that much. Yeah, that's a great example. Thank you for sharing. Um, 
Uh, one question from uh, Russ Lewis. Russ Lewis. Please, Russ. Okay. If you can unmute. Okay, I can make the question, no problem. Uh, actually, the question is how does Beyond Budget compare with lean budgeting? Well, lean budgeting, I guess that is that uh, little component in SAFE that has been added to, to address. Yeah. And uh, um, I'm not, I'm, I know it, it's, uh, it's a bit, uh, there's a heated discussion in, in the Agile community around, around uh, uh, SAFE. Um, people seem to have very strong uh, views, um, either for or against. So I don't want to add, add to that. But uh, I mean, the way I understand it, I don't think lean budgeting really, really cracks it. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so I think you need to. Please, please go ahead, John. I think you. Need, I mean, you need you need to address this from a, like, like we are doing in Beyond Budgeting. <laughs> a, a similar question, however, but more compare, more related to the self-organization. Actually, is how we can compare Beyond Budget with the TL practices, mm. TL organization, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, of course, I mean, I mean, the most progressive beyond budgeting companies, I would, all, I would almost call them teal organizations uh, uh, as such. And, and um, of course, there are, you know, there are, there are many uh, movements, communities out, out there that um, uh, kind of, uh, with many similarities with beyond budgeting, especially on the leadership side. But what makes beyond budgeting especially stand out is that we are the only one that have cracked that the budgeting issue and the budgeting problem. Uh, and that is important because um, today there are so many organization, uh, organizations that are on agile transformation journeys and all of them discover at some point in time and often too late that they will never succeed unless they also address the budgeting process and the budgeting mindset. Uh, it is the, uh, unless you do that, you will never succeed. So it's, it's very much the, it's the missing piece in many agile transformations. Um, it can also actually be an agile transformation in itself because beyond budgeting is about business uh, agility. And I also want to say that, you know, um, uh, scale, I mean, before we talked about business agility, it, it was about scaling agile, right? And, and no offense here, but I think the, the main reason why beyond why, why agile and lean also was such a huge su success had to do with their birthplace. Agile born in software development, lean was born in manufacturing. And what did executives in big companies observe in those early years? Faster projects, lower cost, more happy people. I mean, who can be against that? Fantastic, uh, applause. But then both started to scale, scaling agile, lean enterprise. It started to have implications for executives, their beliefs and their behaviors. And suddenly it wasn't that fun anymore. We have been going for the throat of those executive beliefs from day one, because we were not born uh, out, out there. We were born at executive level or at corporate level as a way to manage organizations. So, um, but again, m many similarities, but we, nobody uh, but us addressed that, that, that important budgeting issue. Thanks. Um, then another comment that I think it's really interesting is related to the fact that the actual budgeting, as most of the company are doing now, it's connected to the capacity to understand how much we are going to spend in a certain period. So it's about predictability. So yeah. this is a question that rises from, from me reading these comments. How beyond budget it can be predictable in some way? The fact that, that you are empower people to manage their budget, what what can we say about that? But I, I want to challenge this this predictability uh, wish because I mean, in an unpredictable business environment, how can how can you make reliable predictions? So so I think it is about um, it is about 
when it comes to, to, to for instance, making decisions about what to spend uh, or yes or no to a project, again, the later you can make that decision, the better it is, because then you have more uh, better information, not just about what you shall say yes or no to, but also your capacity to undertake it. So instead of sitting way earlier and try to predict what you can afford and what you're going to spend, try to do this more continuously and adjust continuously along the way, um, uh, up or down. So um, I think this wish for prediction is one of these solutions of control very often. Thank you. Um, Gordon, Gordon Newland, there is a question from you about artificial intelligence and machine learning, I think. Yeah, there was. So uh, I'm kind of just curious with this, what you're talking about dynamic forecasting and adjusting your, your models as things change. I'm just interested if you're seeing any impact starting to happen or any benefits starting to come out of AI and machine learning that can monitor many, many inputs and start to build its own internal models, perhaps of what the investment decisions or budgeting decisions should be. Well, I'm sure there are opportunities, but we, at, at least at Equinor, uh, we haven't uh, seen any need to 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 um, uh, I mean, go heavily into that that uh, that, that direction. Uh, uh, yeah. So, um, and 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 you know, I, I see. I, you know, sometimes I think this around back to predictions and forecasting. It is a way of compensating for lack of agility. If you think about, uh, um, if you take a maritime example of a super tanker that has a radar screen to provide forecast about what, what lies ahead, you definitely need a very good radar screen because it takes a long time to turn. But if you, if you look at the speedboat, that typically it won't have a radar screen. You're not making any forecast because you can respond the moment you see something, right? So, and, and I see a lot of companies trying to become, um, uh, put a lot of effort into becoming better at forecasting, where maybe they should reroute some of the energy into becoming more agile uh, and more responsive, right? So, so um, yeah, just a reflection on, on, on that. But uh, I'm sure there is a potential in, in what you are describing. We haven't, uh, for different reasons, not, not, not um, explored it, maybe as we, as we could have. Okay. Okay, next question from Charles Fotham. Please, Charles, can you unmute? Hi there, can you hear me? Okay, sorry, I just got myself off mute. Yeah, please, can you? Yeah, great. Thank yeah, I was interested. I, mean, I work in the public sector, I work, work in the UK government, and I was just interested that some of the considerations are obviously different in relation to budgeting specifically, um, although a lot of your wider practices around um you know performance management for example would apply but uh, particularly around budgeting i was just interested if you'd seen um this kind of approach be be possible to implement in in some parts of governments where you've got a central finance ministry allocating resources often on an annual basis and how you can try and reconcile some of the tensions inherent in that mm -hmm. Now, it's a good question. I mean, we get it a lot just beyond budgeting work in the public sector. I've actually written an, an article about this, which you, you'll find on, on, on LinkedIn. Um, and the answer is yes. Um, and first of all, because beyond budgeting is about much more than cost management, right? So, so even if you have an, uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, the, the budget re regime, um, it is about much more. But on, 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 on the cost side, uh, then, uh, and of course, I'm, I'm not a public sector expert, but even if you are given uh, a big bag of money once a year from the level above uh, or from the authorities above, you don't need, uh, as I see it, to, on the same day, split that big bag up in thousands of small bags and hand out those resources to, 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 to the organization. Instead, you could look upon that as a constraint that you need to optimize against continuously as you move along. And, and again, taking these decisions along the way and constantly monitor through dynamic forecasting, how are we doing versus this, con this constraint? Uh, and uh, which means that um, uh, it could tell you that here we can say more yes than no or, or vice versa. So more continuous um, management of cost. And I also want to 
share with you uh, uh, a story from um, uh, Norway. Uh, our um, there's uh, social services. Uh, our social services uh, uh, unit, quite big. They did two very interesting pilots in 2020 in two um, customer contact centers or client cost contact centers. They said that we want to test out what happens if you have no budget whatsoever. So they said, you can spend whatever you want in order to do your job, and we want to see what happens. Now 2020 is over, we have the results. Cost came down in all these, these client contact centers because of lower external activity, travel cost due to COVID, but none had higher cost reductions than these two pilots. Both had 50% cost reduction without the cost budget, which I find quite interesting. Thank you. Next, Thank you. next question from Adam. Uh, hi, um, uh, I'm working a very large traditional organization um, that is based around budgets and um, everything you described as bad. Um, thinking along an agile implementation approach, what is a pragmatic way of trying to shift an organization like that to adopting um, a beyond budgeting approach? We like the think big, start small kind of approach. Hmm. Um, I've helped around 30 of the companies uh, that we looked at uh, to get started and with the majority we started with the separation of those budget purposes. That is something that uh, is not scary, it's something that finance understands and uh, once you have separated and once you start on those improvement discussions you are actually um, on the journey. So a very effective uh, place to start, um, because then when you, when you have these discussions about uh, how can we set better targets, well, what really motivates the, the, the knowledge worker? Um, uh, when it comes to cost management, do we need detailed travel budgets if we say we, we trust people and so on? So it is, um, it, it is a very effective way of, 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 of starting out. Cool. That can Thank take you, you, can take, yeah, so uh, yeah. Yeah, Adam, you, you have also another question, if you can make it. Um, yeah, so sorry if I, I don't mean to monopolize the questions, uh, folks. Um, so, uh, well, one, one I, I put a couple of questions here. One that's key for me is uh, companies often have a P&L um, approach. Uh, is this out of step with beyond budgeting? Is it better for companies to be using a cash approach when using their numbers? Now, well, then you're into the, the, the accounting uh, world as such. And, and, and at Equinor, I mean, we, we have done no changes on how we do kind of statutory accounting. We still, uh, we still provide quarterly results uh, and, 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 and all that stuff on the PL balance sheet format. So this is because that's backwards looking. This is mm -hmm. forward looking. Okay, no, that's why I just wanted to check because I'm not an accountant by training myself. Oh, right, so. right. Yeah. I see a question here about OKRs and beyond budgeting. I've written an article about that as well. Uh, <laughs> uh, and um, um, actually, that, you, you'll find that on the Agile Alliance uh, uh, w w website. Uh, it was the most popular blog last year. And um, there are many similarities between uh, OKRs and ambition to action as such. Um, but um, uh, yeah, actually, it's a long, long story. So. I, th I think the, the important thing with, with OKRs or ambition to action is that if you, have, if you have that stuff and also the old budget, then you have a problem because very often, so if you have both OKRs and budgets, very often there will be conflict between what the OKRs is telling you to do and what the budget is telling you to do. And guess who win that conflict? Right. So, but if you kick out the budget, then really you, you can make the OKRs kind of the, the cornerstone of how you manage. But but you can't have these two parallel concepts that compete with each other. So, um, but check out the article because that's yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Bjork. Thank you, Adam, for the questions. And um, next is coming from Luca. Luca, you can unmute and make your question if you want. Yes, um, you talk about uh, budget and performance review. I was just curious about sales and sales target. Uh, well, I mean, the, the um, um, 
we don't have sales and given our business i mean we 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 we, we don't operate with with, with uh, sales targets as such but uh, but in general i would say that i mean if you can um if you can make uh, these uh, uh, targets relative to something uh it's better so um, um and and and, and again, very often, I've actually I've written a, a, an article about this target, this con, this topic as well. It's called um, "Hitting the Target but Missing the Point," uh, because target setting itself, target setting itself, is there are many aspects that are as problematic as as, as budgets. So instead of my advice to, to many is that instead of trying to find better targets, think about actually abolishing them at all. There are, it, you can perfectly well um, set direction and evaluate performance, even if you have, um, even if you haven't predefined something in a, in a, uh, in, a, in, in a target. You know, when we sit in the autumn the year before and trying to set an annual target, we're actually trying to describe what does good performance look like 12 months down the road. And if there's a lot of uncertainty, how on earth do we know? afterwards that uncertainty is gone so then we know we can have a great discussion about we have the actual numbers on the table um what what, what kind of performance was this the uncertainty is gone we we know the tailwind the headwind and and uh, and so on so um yeah so so uh, i think we are target obsessed that is the problem yeah thank you makes sense and i see the duality between these and what you said before Thank you for the answer. Thank you. Um, I think we have one last question uh, that is from Stuart Manton. Stuart? Hi. Yes. Um, you kind of, I think, answered it a little bit in Adam's response. But my, my question is, what, what's the beyond budgeting view of the use of throughput accounting versus cost accounting? Uh, Again, we we are uh, we are not in we don't have very views specifically on how to do accounting because accounting is about uh, looking backwards. That that's the past, right? And this is very much about the forward-looking uh, uh, things. Uh, so so I actually I, I I don't have an answer for you. Uh, I'm afraid. Okay. Well, I think that this is the perfect question <laughs> to close the session. <laughs> um, actually, I had a question, but uh, one of the, the attendees made this for me. So I think it was a great session. I want to thank you again, Bjorte, for, uh, for sharing this. In the chat, you can find uh, um, the links uh, to some of the articles mentioned during the conversation. There are some references, so you feel free to copy that. Um, again, thank you, the for uh, for this session. The video will be posted soon in in our YouTube channel. And thank you everyone for joining this session. I think it was amazing. There are some things that uh, I think we can listen for a second time and try to understand how we can introduce this in our companies. Thank you all. Have a great evening. Ah, by the way, just one comment. This time we were really, really close to make the world circle around the world because we had someone from California. We had someone from Africa. We had someone from South America, uh, from uh, Europe, most from UK and continental Europe and whatever. So thank you for, uh, for joining this session. Your fame nice. precedes us all. Yeah, see, see you next week, however. Next week, the speaker will be from New Zealand, so at least that area will be covered. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. Enjoy the evening or day. Thank you. All right.